Uh, can I thank everyone for turning up tonight? Uh, we have a busy agenda ahead of us with many important issues that uh, affect us all here in this room. Uh, do we have apologies from anyone today? Councillor David B. will be signing late. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. I'm from um, Chris Edge, who's the chair of the um, Race Park Association, and also Tony Edwards, who's the vice chair. Both of them are unwell, so you'll have to cope with the secretary of the <laughs> Race Park Association, and um, Neil Milligan from London Borough of Merton. So there'll be a bit of smart improvisation on the planning matters later on. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce myself. My name is Councillor Omar Bush. I represent the Raised Park Ward. Uh, we have councillors here, I believe, from um, Cannon Hill, West Farms, and Don Donald. So I'm sure if you have any questions afterwards, they'll be around. Uh, <coughs> um, so moving on to the open forum, we have Councillor Draper, who has kindly um, has kindly mentioned that he will uh, speak briefly about the Morley Park and give us a bit of information about that. Hello everybody, good evening to you. I'm Dr Nick Draper. I'm a cabinet member for community and culture, and that includes uh, a number of things, which include, including green spaces. And uh, does everybody know about Morley Park here? Okay, Morley Park is the grounds of the old Atkinson Morley Hospital. It sits on the kind of boundary between Village Ward and Rains Park Ward. And when uh, the hospital was sold to Barclay Homes to be redeveloped, um, the council decided uh, that it wanted to do two things with the grounds as part of a Section 106 agreement. Uh, first of all, to create playing fields for the Ursuline School, because the Ursuline was the only one of our senior schools which didn't have playing fields of its own. And second of all, to create a park, effectively a nature park, uh, for the people of Merton. It's been really, really difficult. I'll tell you for why. Uh, working with the developer, particularly when they're developing a large site, is always going to be complicated. There's been problems involving with the uh, with the um, playing fields getting wet, various other things like that. They've been solved over time. Each time we got better and better. And then just after I came into office, uh, there was a problem nationwide with uh, Japanese knotweed. And I'm sure that <coughs> it, it, most of you know what Japanese knotweed is. It is an incredibly invasive weed, which is very, very difficult to get rid of. At this stage, we looked at it and thought, well, not only, not only do we not want Japanese not within our own parks, but we've also got surrounding that park some of the most expensive uh, and valued property in the whole of uh, of, of London, basically. Uh, and we certainly didn't want that Japanese not we to be invading other people's property. So we looked at how we could actually deal with it, and we found out that the only way that we could deal with it effectively was to be working to work out a lease agreement with Barclay Homes, whereby for the next 22 years, Barclay Homes, who frantically wanted to actually give us the property, would actually hold the lease um, with a uh, uh, with a sum of a, a million pounds along held alongside it, just in case anything goes wrong with the Japanese knotweed. That's been a very difficult um, uh, legal thing to deal with. I'm very, very glad I didn't have to deal with it myself. We have eventually come to the end of it. We now know that the park will be opening. I haven't got an exact date for you, but I believe in the next two to three weeks. And the park, there will be an official opening of the park on the 4th of May. Commonly known as Stars with Star Wars the other uh, day. Do you know why? I made the fourth three with you. I feel very privileged. Yesterday I took the Ursuline School around the park. Uh, they're having a governor's meeting tomorrow 
where they will officially uh, accept that they're going to have a, a, a lease. It's a, 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 a low cost lease, but it's not a valueless lease. Uh, to, to lease the, uh, the uh, playing field from Merton. And uh, they will be coming in on April the 14th, and then the park opens. The one thing that I would say yesterday, lovely sunny day, beautiful weather, and just looked at that park and thought, what a gorgeous thing, what a gorgeous gift to the people of Merton. And we really are very pleased. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you say officially opening, um, is that to the public or to special VIPs or the uh, public? Hope, I, I, I intend, <laughs> I, I haven't got an exact date, which annoys me a bit, <laughs> but I intend that it will have been open to the general public before the official opening. Oh, okay. There's a very good reason for that, okay? Now, just coming in, you know, all guns blazing, and then finding out that something's already wrong <laughs> that nobody had foreseen, you really don't want to do that. So I'd like to have a good couple of weeks kind of setting in period first. Pat, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, the North South Footway, is yes. that a public right of way, and would it remain so? Uh, notice locks on gates and that. It will remain a public right away, the North South Footway. I believe it's open at all times. Uh, the park itself will be closed of a night time. Uh, there's some very good reasons for that, including the fact that, of course, uh, as, as it has got the Ursuline playing fields in it, they, the, 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 the schoolgirls do need to be protected. That's just the way that the world works these days, that all schools have fencing round them that can be shut down uh, at, at where, where needed. One thing though that I would point out about those playing fields and of course the pavilion which is for the main part going to be uh, for the use of the Ursuline school that round the playing fields there's a path it's a circular path and I believe that it's the first path in Merton, and certainly not parts to be designed to be dementia friendly. As we all know, uh, with you know uh, uh, the the uh, a pre with increasing age, the risk of dementia grows, and one in three of us, according to the current statistics, will have dementia by the time we die. I mean, it's just just the way of the world. Isn't it? it doesn't actually stop you being <coughs> mobile, and. Uh, Obviously, people need to exercise. The idea of this path, it's a long path around the playing fields, is so that people who have dementia can exercise by themselves without getting lost. Because it starts at the pavilion and it comes back to the pavilion. And it's very, very difficult to actually lose yourself on that path. I'm incredibly proud of that. Mm -hmm. I'm my name's Diana Hodson and I'm part of Friends of Lord uh, Park. Uh, thank you very much for the update, Councillor, that you've answered on the two of the outside meetings that we've had. If I could just raise a, a couple of issues. We were part of the inspection that um, Councillor Draper led a few, a few weeks ago, and there are one or two outstanding um, work issues to be completed before and some legal documentation still needs completion before, unless there's an update on that, but still, the legal documents still need completing before the official opening date is confirmed. Um, one follows on really from your comments about the dementia path, which is the sloping path which leads from that area up into the main meadow area itself. That was designed to be for the less able, the less mobile, um, the types of plans and what have you, without the need of the steps that otherwise lead up between the two areas. But it, it doesn't seem that work is, is to be done on that path, and it's still pretty unpassable quite frankly and certainly for the less able, less mobile of us, it's not, it's not usable. So we are still hoping that work will be done on, on that path before That won't happen there. I'm afraid. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, it's uh, looking at it, first of all, it, it's not easy, but I took the pushchair up, up, up it when, when, when we went on the inspection 
and Jane Barnes, I don't know if Jane's here tonight, but, but uh, she walks up it with a stick. The important thing to, to, to bear in mind, that when you get to the top of that grass slope, and it's, it's difficult because it's relatively steep, and also if it's grass, you end up, again, in a grass area, and that's a grass area that will be cut infrequently during the course of, uh, of the year. So it will be, once you actually get up the slope, uh, in, in a wheelchair or in a pushchair for that matter, it will be quite difficult to actually get round afterwards anyway. There is disability access to that area, which is fairly easy to get to. It does mean going on the side, but that's, that, that, that's as it happens. The reason why I don't want that, uh, that path to be, to be paved is that the dementia pathway doesn't diverge. Very easy for people with dementia to get lost on pathways if they diverge, if they fork. Okay? And if it's quite clear that the path is going in a particular direction and not any other one, then people won't get lost. I hear what you're saying. Obviously, I'm disappointed. I don't know if most of the group is disappointed because that's not what was in the section <coughs> 6 agreement. That's not that part is. of that agreement. Um, there were a couple of other points that I made, Chair, mm, yeah. partly because the other one is not here tonight, the other one is not here tonight. Um, one of the other issues is that the, the, the four and five storey blocks are now are going to be pretty visible from the park when they're complete. As part of the drainage works, quite a lot of the um, native trees and plants were lost, and it's unclear as to whether or not they're going to be replaced once the park is open? I don't have an answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. I can tell you that the, there, are, there, there are bare areas that I'm aware of, and uh, the, the, they are, at the moment, a little bit short of topsoil. Um, it, it, it's, it's not, again, something that's, uh, that, that, that worries me particularly. Um, it, it's, it's a pity. I'd love to see everything absolutely perfect. But it's not going to be. You, you'll, or if, if people look for faults, they will find faults. If people look for an absolutely beautiful park, which is a gift from the, the, from the London Borough of Merton to the people of Merton, that's what they'll find. If they look for faults, they'll find faults. I totally accept it's, it's going to be a fantastic park. I equally think that Park for Homes needs to be compliant with Section 106 agreements. You know, they are equally yeah. fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether it's maybe something that can be communicated offline, um, or whether it's worth possibly emailing these queries is, over to it's Councillor Drake. It's been communicated um, already. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank Councillor Drake for coming here tonight and giving us an update on the Morley Park. Um, I think because we've got busy agenda tonight, so there's a lot of people that want to get through and ask. And I appreciate that, but it was because I don't. I don't are, we, are we taking the planning item this evening? Um, I believe we are. Yeah. There is a I don't know whether, um, yeah. Um, but we had two other items that have come up today. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we have uh, two other items on the open forum tonight. Uh, one's an update from my Rains Park. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to say a few words. Yes. Hello, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm the chairman of the My Rains Park Festival. For those of you who don't know, the My Rains Park Festival is a 10-day festival that happens in Rains Park in the summer. So the dates for it this year are June the 28th to July the 7th. Um, the programme is actually pretty much is, is finished now and uh, is getting to the designer in a week. So it's, although it's a few months off, it's still, uh, it's still getting there. So the programmes will probably be around from the beginning of the day and on the website then as well. So I can tell you the kind of things it would include is poetry evenings, comedy, uh, lectures, music, pub quiz, art, film screening, and uh, lots of other things as well. Uh, we're continuing to work with schools, so with Rens Park High School, with West Wimbledon Primary School, uh, with their autism department there, and with Hollymount Primary School as well. On the July the 7th, we have our big community fun day, which we call Rens Laugh in the Park. And
and uh, that is gets up bigger and bigger every year. And this year we've got a kind of full program from swing dance to drumming workshops to arts to African acrobats to Segaris dance, local company, bowling, football, and all sorts of things. So that will be a great day in Holland Gardens on July the 7th. I believe I'm also the next item, which is Merton Citizens. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Hi, my name is Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a member of Merton Citizens. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Merton Citizens, uh, Merton Citizens is a community organisation, a uh, community organising group. And there are 21 uh, organisations which are part of that in Merton. So that's everything from faith groups, churches, mosques, schools, Wimbledon College, St Mark's and Mitcham, and the uh, uh, South London Mental Health Trust as well. So altogether there's 21 organisations, about 12,000 within our organisations. And uh, we work with the council and polity issues on issues of uh, common good. So we have uh, three issues that we're working on at the moment. One of them is housing. So we have brought to the council's attention the, the issue of rogue landlords, which they've been kind of very positive about supporting. And I believe there is a motion being put into uh, the council about, about that, to do all that issue. The other thing with housing is affordable housing. Like lots of you, we're very concerned about the issue of affordable housing in this area. So we're looking at areas with the council of things like community land trusts and trying to find potential sites for that. Um, so I'm not the best person on housing, but do look up community land trusts because it's very interesting. Uh, we've also, the second issue is mental health. So we've been providing training, uh, kind of mental health first aid training, and then filtering that out through our member organisations, which has been particularly beneficial with the schools and the Armadilla Mosque, which has really filtered out that mental health training. And the, uh, the schools, particularly led by Wimbledon College and St Mark's, are now looking at a school's mark for helping schools in Merton to really um, think about how they can best help young people and staff um, who are struggling with mental health issues. And then the third thing that we're working on is refugee welcome. So um, Rains Park became Rains Park Community Church, of which I'm a member of and is one of the members of uh, Merton Citizens, became the uh, first group in London, second group in the country, to be a community sponsor of refugees. And so now we're going to be talking to our MPs about getting the community sponsorship scheme, which is a way for uh, private citizens and groups to help refugees of getting that scheme extended beyond 2020. And the last thing we're working on is, is Lift the Ban, which is a campaign uh, to help asylum seekers. At the moment, if you're an asylum seeker, you are not allowed to work at all. And uh, we're trying to get that changed, that law changed, so that you can work after six months of applying. Because at the moment, I have a friend who's a science teacher at my school. He had seven to eight years whilst he was waiting for his asylum application. And during that time, he wasn't able to have a job, so he wasn't able to contribute <coughs> to the economy, or uh, wasn't great for his mental health, all of those issues. Um, so that's Merton Citizens. I'm, I'm going to have to give my apologies, because like I say, we are still working on that programme, and I've got two days to get it finished. But thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have Claire here tonight, who wants to talk about se the sexual health strategy. That's right. There's a couple of things, but I will be very quick. Um, I just wanted to let people know that Merton Public Health have just started developing their five-year sexual health strategy for Merton. So they've got a survey, and I'll ask Chris to put the details on, on the notes, um, which closes on the 20th of April. And they're really wanting to have as many people respond to this, staff, service users, residents, parents, and anyone else who spends any time in Merton. So please think about just having a look at that and, and completing it. So that's that's my one, one bit. The other bit is, I'm chair of AGK in Merton. We have got a planning for the future with AGK in Merton um, event on the 10th of April from 4 till 8 p.m. at the Wimbledon Art Space, which is at the back of Wimbledon Library. We'll have businesses and other organizations 
that offer support and services to people as they're getting older, expert speakers holding workshops on financial, legal and care issues affecting older people, um, and support from local charities, health and care on how to stay active and connected. It's a free event. We'll have a drop of wine or a fruit juice for anyone who comes through the door. Um, you can drop in any time between 4 and 8. And I've got a pile of leaflets over there. Please do take one. And there's a couple of other things. We have a lunch is on us. Anyone over 50 can have a free lunch at HUK Merton once. Only once. Only one offer. <laughs> Up until April, oh, where is it? Um, April the 30th. You do need to book in, but come and come and come and experience lunch with AGK. And there's also a What's On guide for the next three months. Lots and lots of events in there, so they're all over there. Before you go, pick them up. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something about trees. Um, the Apostles Residence Association um, wanted to give some money to the council, two thousand pounds, to plant a few trees um, and we've done this before but the response from the council was well we can't take your money we might be able to plant the trees but we haven't got any money to look after them and so we are fairly horrified so we were sort of saying well can't you take 1500 for the trees and 500 pounds for so we're raising that with huge concerns because environmentally this makes no sense all right our 2000 pounds isn't going to sort of change Rains Park tomorrow, but if each year we can put a bit in. So we're very, very concerned that the council are not doing what they used to do and, and enabling us to help plant some trees. So I just wanted to put that on the table for people to be aware of. I suppose there's no way we as local residents to do the work. It has to be done by, if there are trees. Well, yeah, because yeah, it, it can't be sponsored by an individual. Cause uh, we die and the trees go on, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an update today from the Assembly Member for Merton and Wandsworth. Uh, who would like to also say a few words. I will. I'll take it forward. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Leone Cooper and I'm the London Assembly Member for Merton and Wandsworth. And I was trying to think um, what has happened since I was last here in this very room talking to you. Actually, I think that's evening we spent most of it talking about... Um, street cleaning, rubbish recycling, and uh, the introduction of wheelie bins, which has got nothing to do with me, I'm very pleased to say. <laughs> <laughs> so no doubt you'll be again tomorrow, I'll number five and discuss that. Um, you'll have an enjoyable, last time it was a pretty um, heated debate. Um, I've brought a few of these, um, which is a sort of an updated version, it's our annual report for 1718. Now you'll be pleased to hear I'm not actually going to go through the whole thing. Um, but essentially we are the voice of Londoners, so in my case particularly Merton and Wandsworth, and our other thing that we do is that we hold the Mayor to account. Um, and there are 25 of us and we sit on a variety of committees that look at what the Mayor is doing and whether he's actually getting on with fulfilling the things that he said he was going to do in his original election manifesto. We can also suggest things as well and say, well, we think this might be a good idea for you to do this. Um, we can do that individually through what's called rapporteurships. Um, we can also do it through our committees. We bring in expert guests and we produce very detailed reports for the recommendations. Now, last year, during um, 2018, we sign off um, on all the mayoral strategies as the London Assembly. We signed off on the environment strategy, the mayor's transport strategy, the knife crime strategy. I'm not really thinking that one's actually going terribly well at the moment. Um, it's the same across the whole of the country, I should say. It's not just a, a London issue. Um, we've signed off um, on a whole range of these big strategies. The one that we haven't signed off on is the London plan. And that has a huge uh, responsibility in law because planning is partly dealt with by, in this case, Merton. It's partly dealt with the borough level. But sometimes the planning issues also go up to the mayor. And he can completely take over planning applications and make the decision himself. But he also has the responsibility if there's more than 150 units in a development or if it's more than about 10 storeys high, about 30 metres high, he also gets to sort of say whether or not he likes what's being proposed. 
But overall, in between the national planning policy framework and the local planning policy frameworks, sits the London plan. And from the middle of January of this year until the middle of May, we're going through what's called the examination in public. I've never been involved in this before. I have been involved in a couple of um, planning uh, inspectorate inquiries into cycle paths or road widening schemes and things like this. But this looks at the whole of the London plan. Um, and so the discussion that we were just having earlier on, and I'm sure we're going to come back to some other issues about um, green spaces, open spaces, tree planting, um, whether the development of housing should be in blocks of more than five storeys, six storeys, ten storeys, who makes those decisions, is all covered in the London plan. So the discussion that we were having this morning um, was on matter 68, M68, and it covered London plan items G1 and G4, which are then divided down into a whole over. So it's quite complex and quite technical. Um, but it was very interesting because what we were talking about was green and open spaces. And how do we preserve them in London, bearing in mind that elsewhere in the London plan, and certainly in the Mayor's housing strategy, and certainly as I think we all know, there is a housing crisis in London, um, either because people simply can't find anything, or because when they do find it, it's actually simply too expensive for them. Um, and I also sit on the housing committee, so I've just spent this afternoon um, listening to people talking, including some representatives from uh, the community land trust um, movement, um, talking about you know uh, how we make sure that what we're developing is uh, being done on TfL land. <coughs> and one of the great examples that was being given in that meeting was talking about TfL working with Merton to come forward with some really hopefully successful plans to transform Morden as a town centre from well, what is frankly uh, the A24 racetrack that goes around the civic centre. And it's, you know, the, the nicest thing about uh, Morden Town Centre for me is when I've crossed the road and I haven't been run over. I mean, it's actually, I think it's actually just dangerous. So I think having really good plans to do something there um, is, is an absolute boom. But the London plan obviously covers everywhere. So things like tree planting um, is a really important part of it. They'll be talking about trees tomorrow. I will be going back in to talk about waste uh, and recycling, but on the sort of slightly larger scale than um, individual um, provision of uh, wee bins or not wee bins, and um, whether food waste collection should be done. So once that has gone through the examination in public, we'll hopefully then be signed off with some amendments by the inspectors, and it then comes fully into force, and that then drives um, a lot of what will happen in London over the next few years. Um, and it's uh, quite, it has really quite significant impact, I think, for all of us, wherever we live, and um, for the way in which the areas that we live in are developed. I'll just say one more thing, and then um, if you've got questions, I'm still very happy to take them as well. And that's, I just wanted to remind everybody, hopefully you have seen the publicity, and um, if you need to, go onto the TfL website to check. But the um, 8th of April is when the new ultra-low emission zone, which the previous mayor actually announced in 2015, it's coming in in central London where the congestion zone is now. It's slightly different because the current congestion zone only operates between certain hours. The new ultra-low emission zone operates 24-7, 365 days a year. So um, if you're driving a petrol car that was roughly made before 2006, or if you're driving a diesel car that does not comply with Euro 6 diesel standards, you will have to pay if you drive your car into the central London congestion zone, and that is on top of the congestion zone charge that you have to pay in the hours when the congestion zone is operational. And the reason for that is, uh, we can't see it, but London's air is filthy, the number of diesel vehicles on the road is just going up and up and up um, and we do need to do something about um, trying to encourage people to stop driving um, vehicles that are spitting out um, particles and gases um, that are not doing us any good at all. I'll leave it there. Thank you very Great. much. Are there any questions? Um, Crossrail. Can you tell us anything nice about Crossrail 2? We've sort of quietly assumed that it's gone down the pan, but do you have a response? What responsibility do, do, do you guys have in relation to that? And have you got any comments that might be useful? Well, I think it's a good question. Um, I think it's a good question. 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 I think it
Well, I, I don't think it's come down the pan, but I think it's certainly receded at the moment. Uh, I mean, apart from anything else, it's quite hard to see that the original timetable to get a hybrid bill into Parliament, which was supposed to happen sometime during 2019, I don't know, they seem to be a bit tied up in Parliament with some <laughs> I, I can't quite work out what it was, what it is. Uh, actually, I don't think they can quite work out what it is. Uh, so um, even if we hadn't got the issue that... Um, m actually, the original budget for Crossrail 1 was reduced, so we've actually just re-inflated uh, the budget back up to the original size. Um, but the way that it's being funded is that the GLA um, is going to take some loans. So, I mean, I really do think we need to finish Crossrail 1 before we move on to Crossrail 2. So for two reasons, I certainly think the timetable that Michelle Dix was sharing with me, and I'm sure sharing certainly with the councillors, and I'm sure sharing with some of you, has now probably receded slightly. I can't see them getting the hybrid bill into the Parliament this year because they needed to reconsult with everybody on the adjustments that they've made to the route that they previously consulted on, which obviously we all have quite a lot to say about. Certainly in Merton and Wandsworth, in my constituency, a lot of people had a lot to say about it um, in terms of you know where, where the route was going and where the stations were going to be situated. So I wouldn't say that all is lost, but I would say that it's definitely been pushed back. And Crossrail 1 has also, if you're not aware, definitely been pushed back as well, and probably further back um, than the original indications were likely to be. Just been in the Can the Mayor call in for review uh, cases of where Merton Planning has awarded a certain uh, sector, which is taking up metropolitan open land against the local residents' opinion. I would probably have to look into that. But it's I a would politically loaded question. Yes. And we're I quite upset by Merton planning. Yes, I mean, I, I don't know. I'd need to know more about the precise details. I'd and be delighted um, to do that. What I will do, uh, they're in those blue booklets over there. If you want to write to me, I'm going to give you that. You can either write it in there or just uh, or just email me. The, the, my, my email, along with all the other assembly members, is we look like the usual suspects in various of the photographs in here. But all of our contact, <laughs> we do seriously. We look, they, they seem to, seem to make us look like you know prison break. <laughs> there we are. All looking a bit um, stiff. So it's got some comments from us all on what we do, but it has got all of our contact details in here. It's also got some pictures of tunnels and things uh, to do with Crossrail. But if you want to get hold of me with specific questions like that, I'm not a planning expert. Usually, if something has gone through a process, the mayor can only intervene um, in certain quite specific circumstances. So uh, my initial response would be to say, I, pr I think probably I not, but I don't know without you giving me more information about that. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't want to mislead no. you through ignorance. Um, Thank you very much. And I'm not a planning expert, so I'm just going to put that back in again. We have another question from Michael. Leonie, as you say, one of the Mayor's responsibilities is over crime in London. As you mentioned, London is suffering from a knife crime epidemic, which has also affected Merton and Wandsworth. What have you done to hold Sadiq Khan to account on this issue? Well, I think that question is predicated on the idea that in some ways Sadiq is personally responsible. And what I've actually done is to hold the borough commander to account and also to hold Cressida Dick to account and also to look into the things that are fueling this. And it's not just, as I said, a knife crime epidemic in London. It is actually across the whole of the country. Um, we have a police and crime committee which is called in Sophie Linden, who's the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, um, several times to account for herself and what the Metropolitan Police are doing. But I think we all have to understand that these things are lagging indicators, and we now have a cohort of 16 or 17 year olds who, over the last few years, because the amount of money that councils have had to spend has been reduced by a fairly significant sum. So we do have children who've had less of an input in terms of you know, keeping them occupied and out of harm's way, 
and um, you know, in, in certain cases, they may have been excluded from school, or you know, there's a whole series of different things that have happened. Some of them um, you could say are in the mayor's gift, but a lot of them aren't, and these are not problems. Certainly, from my discussions with talking to the police, they are not problems that arrive overnight and certainly not just in the last three years. I think what's really important is that this year, the uh, start, of, start of last year was an absolutely disastrous start of the year. So things have improved this year, although obviously you know, every time you turn on the radio or the television or open the paper, you can see that um, you know, there's been yet another um, incident has happened with um, you know, a, a, a young person being stabbed. Well, and there's also been a big increase in um, domestic violence that has also included people being stabbed as well. Um, and the mayor has now decided to set up a violence reduction unit and to adopt the model from Glasgow and has also raised your council tax um, bills, if they've not landed with you yet, I'm sure, I'm sure they probably, probably will be arriving very soon, you'll notice that the mayor's precept has gone up by 8.9% because the government has said we're not going to give any of the police and crime commissioners across the country any more money, but if you want to put up your precepts to increase the amount of money and resources to come into the police, then you can. So all the PCCs, police and crime commissioners nationally, are doing it. And you would have heard the police say, you know, we think we're, too sh we're 20,000 officers short nationally, not just in London. So I think we do need more police on the street. I think we do need more PCSOs. We need more liaison with schools. I think that's a really important thing. And the PCSOs were very good at sort of bridging the gap between people who, you know, teenagers who don't have much trust in the police. Um, you know, so I think I think there's a lot more that we can do, and I hope that we're going to do it. So we have been holding the mayor to account. We've been holding Sophie uh, Linden to account, and we've also been holding Cressida Dick to account. And we do it sometimes through meetings that are public and webcast, and we sometimes do it behind closed doors. Uh, gentlemen, at back. you should also hold the Home Secretary to account because that's where the central funding has been slashed. I mean, the other day we we are the fourth um, in the portion of the population. Um, with a fourth worst country in the whole of Europe now with uh, police ratios to population size. Um, and I worked, I've worked in the Home Office 45 years and I'm retired now. And, um, you know, you look back and one thing, you know, people love or hate Maggie Thatcher, the last thing she ever did was to cut the police. The law and order is a vital part of society and these cuts have been unprecedented. So I think, you know, so it's not just... You know, blaming the mayor, it's also mm -hmm. blaming the central government. And the more the London Assembly puts pressure on the centre, uh, particularly these horrible figures on on, uh, on murder, murder, it's murder. Um, then the pressure should go up through the assembly, and as much power as you members can have, and push it towards the prime minister and the home secretary, because there needs to be a top up. Yeah. It, you shouldn't put nine percent on on pensioners locally paid for the police. Why do we pay income tax? Why do we pay, why do we pay VAT? Because it's central funding. You, you know, it's, it's, it's a very big issue. It, it is, and I think you um, put your finger on something actually we have spent a lot of time doing. I mean, I also sit on one of the more internal committees, which is budget and performance, and we've had these discussions, and we are as one on the Assembly, whether we're Labour, Conservative, Green, Liberal Democrat, or UKIP, or whatever they're calling themselves, that have changed the name, they're calling themselves the Brexit Alliance or something now. Um, uh, sorry, I can't keep up with them, they keep changing their name. Um, you know, we are as one in saying, you know, this is wrong. And of course, that was one of the reasons why uh, the current Prime Minister fell out with the previous Mayor of London, because there were huge cuts when Boris was the Mayor of London, and of course, she then turned around after he'd spent three hundred thousand pounds on the water cannon and said you can't use them. So, so they have actually not gone on for quite some considerable period of time. But of course, Amber Rudd then came in as the Home Secretary and made further cuts. And in London, we are also, and um, I know outside of London, people sometimes say well, we, we we get a lot of funding, but you know nobody else has. You know, the Queen is pretty much constantly in residence. You know, so we. We have a lot of them, and also the rest of the royal family, and obviously they do have other places where they are around the country, but they spend much more time here. We also have Parliament itself, um, which we have to protect, and that's protected by the Metropolitan Police. We give support to all of the other forces in terms of counter-terror. You know, it was uh, the Metropolitan Police who went down to Salisbury to help with the 
forces down there. So there are huge pressures on us, and there's a special grant called the NIC grant, which is a national and international capital cities grant. And the government said, yes, you, you're £112 million short in that grant. We're going to give you £12 million this year. So, I mean, it is incredibly difficult. I mean, you can imagine if we then turn around and said, well, fine, we're not going to have any police outside the Houses of Parliament, they might, they might sit up and take a bit of notice. But we can't possibly do that because we have literally just gone past... Uh, the anniversary of the appalling attack on Westminster <coughs> Bridge. So, you know, there is a big stretch on what the police are doing, and it is in the face of quite considerable cuts, as, as you point out. I mean, I didn't come into politics to argue in favour of police station closures or reductions in the police. And, you know, it's been a very difficult period. Um, you know, in, in t and, and Boris had to make a lot of uh, police station closures, and Sadiq's had to look at that as well. So these, these are very... But we'd rather do that than, you know, reduce the number of officers on the street for the reasons that, you know, uh, we were talking about earlier. We're going to take our last three questions from the council at the back. The gentleman in the blue, Stephen, if you'd like to go first. Uh, thank you. I, I, um, I absolutely agree with what you said about PCSOs. Um, and we've been trying to find out, uh, I'm one of the, the dem councils for this award, we've been trying to find out about um, the councils, as you know, can pay to have extra police officers. Um, <coughs> although Merton doesn't at the moment do that. You can't yeah, kindly used to call it bog off, buy one, get and, one. Uh, yes. <laughs> you can't pay to have extra PCSOs. Do you know where that is? And is that something you can try and um, use your influence so that we, so that councils do have the ability to, to buy extra PCSOs as well as other officers? I think the answer is going to be no, because we've been pressing them on the, the idea about the, 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 the police constables. And the Met are pretty keen to move away from that because then it <coughs> nails the officers down in a way that they want to have more flexibility. So I don't think they'll introduce it for PCSOs because they're trying to get away from it. <coughs> for it's, a PCSOs. it's a way of actually getting extra officers. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. I, I can ask. I can ask. Please do. That would be great. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to give you one of these so you can write it down oh, as well. Just to remind me. Yeah. Gentlemen, Blue. What's the situation with Wimbledon Police Station? I knew as soon as I mentioned Police Station. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was bound to ask that question. Ask that. Um, the latest um, that I've... I've been in contact with um, councillors from all of the political parties um, on Merton Council about this. I've spoken at a number of the community forums, obviously the Wimbledon Forum particularly. And um, the situation is that the final decision has still not been made, because I have been writing fairly frequently to Sophie Linden to say what is going on. Um, they are reviewing the decision because that's what they were obliged to do, but they've not made a final decision about whether to uh, close it or whether to keep it open. That is the latest I can tell you. Okay. Our final question from Stephen. Hello. I'm Stephen Kerr, one of the Casters of Lanes Park. Um, I quite agree with you when you said what we need is more police on the street. But it seems to me that they're not effective if they're not also doing stop and search. Now, unfortunately, in the past, the Met Police have been criticised for their stop and search approach, and probably rightly so. But I think that's the crucial point. We need more police. They need to be able to intervene and search people to see if they're carrying for knives. I was just wondering what the London Assembly thought about stop and search. Well, it's a complex issue, and I'd say that different members of the Assembly have probably taken different positions on it. But overall, um, we want the police to uh, do intelligence-led operations. So if they can prove that the people that they're stopping and searching, that there's a high percentage of them they're then finding actually do have weapons, um, we want to monitor that very closely, which we can do because we get really good stats from MOPAC, from the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. But we will then also be looking at that in terms of ethnicity, because one of the um, things that has regularly come up is a feeling of, um, you know, that the police are targeting certain groups of people, rightly or wrongly. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, that there isn't just a lot of people all being stopped and searched just because they don't like the look of them, for whatever reason that might be, and they're never found with anything on them in any case. So that's something that I look at on a very regular basis for both Merton and Wandsworth. Um, the other thing is that they occasionally use, and they've just actually had one on Borough, um, Section 60 powers, which last for a certain period of time, and they can literally stop and search anybody and 
everybody for a period of 24 hours. And the reason they just had that was because of the incident at Figs Marsh, which you, I'm sure you've um, heard about. Uh, but they are very finite and only last a certain period of time. It's a difficult position. I mean, I would like to have all schools with knife arches as well so that they can, um, you know, check people as they're coming into and out of school um, because there's been a number of incidents where it's been, you know, they've left school and then had a, some sort of argument near a shop, you know, a kebab shop, actually. There was a young boy stabbed near Clapham South um, Tube Station. They'd all just left St Francis Xavier Sixth Form College around the corner. You know, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, um, but persuading people not to carry knives and then trying to find out when they are carrying knives and take the knives off them and then treating it in this sort of holistic and round way has to be the way forward. I'd like to thank the London Assembly member yeah. for coming oh, tonight to speak to us. Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and if, if you have got any further questions, I'll leave a few of these, and if you don't use them, then I'm, I'm sure Chris will yeah. recycle them to a, a subsequent meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next point uh, on the agenda, we're looking at uh, parking and increased uh, parking fees and with the 20 minute free parking. I believe uh, Catherine James will be speaking to us tonight with her colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Kath James um, and I'm the Interim Assistant Director for Public Protection at Merton Council, uh, which involves parking charges. Um, I'm, a, I'm accompanied by my colleagues uh, Ben Stevens, who's the head of parking, and yeah. also Mike Robinson, who's a consultant in public health. So between the three of us, we're going to talk to you about uh, the council's new uh, strategic direction with regard to parking charges. Um, we specifically want to talk <coughs> this evening about the consultation that the council is about to launch um, with regard to its new um, parking policies. And Merton as a council realises that it has a significant role to play in terms of developing that policy. Um, it's about air quality, it's about demand for parking spaces and managing that, and it's about congestion. Um, the council's whole... Oh, apologies. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're going to cover three key things here in terms of uh, what's being proposed, um, why it's being proposed, and most importantly, um, to give a very clear message this evening that the council is listening and is very interested to hear from residents with regard to what you think about and, and, and for you to have your say. And um, we'll come on to some details about how you can do that in a minute. Um, just we'll have in our say tonight, won't we? I mean, did you well. Um, <laughs> In terms of, before I go on to what's being um, proposed and not proposed in the consultation, um, I just wanted to talk about a couple of key things. Um, the council has very limited levers um, within its toolbox in reality to deal with um, setting new parking charges. Um, and this is very much a policy about encouraging less car usage, stopping people, stopping cars um, you know, on the highway. Um, and also looking about how we develop more sustainable transport solutions and get people into active travel mode. Um, we know that over 9,000 Londoners died from premature deaths um, due to um, bad air quality. Um, this is an issue that's risen significantly in prominence. Um, and I don't think a day goes by um, at the moment without us hearing about another article or about another news story where realistically councils up and down the land um, are seeking challenges and solutions for this. So, yes it is parking, um, but it's also about air quality. Um, it's about stopping the onward march of conditions like obesity and diabetes. Um, one factor that links all of these is this thing that I call active travel. And what these charges are designed to do is to nudge people into the right direction to have choices. Um, it's often been said that parking charges are a blunt tool. We know they're a blunt tool, but they are a tool we have in our toolbox. <coughs> um, we genuinely believe that we should be using them. We don't stand alone on this issue. Um, the Assembly member mentioned the ULEZ zone. There's not a single um, tier of central, local, or indeed regional government that isn't trying to come together to tackle these problems. And air quality knows no boundaries. It doesn't deal with administrations. Um, and these are the sorts of things that uh, our parking um, charges um, are designed to do. They're looking to, to protect our environment as a whole. 
shifting travel towards sustainable modes of transport and ultimately towards less polluting vehicles. Um, we believe the charges are proportionate and reasonable. Um, they're different and they're proportionate in demand in different parts of the borough. Um, Merton is not homogenous in terms of its availability to pro public transport links. And some other people in the borough may not have similar links to what somebody who lives in central Wimbledon will have. Um, this policy will undoubtedly ignite a mixture of opposition and also um, support. Um, perhaps more opposition, yes. admittedly. Um, 100%. But it's this kind of change, and it's the ability to make some of these brave decisions, that we have to find some more radical solutions um, to dealing with these problems. It's a fundamental tenet of economic policy that price does drive change. Um, it's about highlighting the true cost of car ownership, and it's about the awareness and raising that awareness of the undesired impact that that car ownership and usage can have. The shift to getting people out of the cars has got to start somewhere, and we believe it starts here. Um, part of the nudge is realising that not everybody can give up their vehicles. Um, some people may argue that these charges are too high. Some people have argued that in some instances they're too low. What we are saying is this is our proposition at the moment, and we are happy for people to come back to this on that proposition. Um, and also, um, you know, the council intends to keep this under review. Uh, we know this is going to be a dynamic movement. We know that it's going to take some time to realise whether these changes have had enough influence to bite. Um, and, and what ultimately would success look like? Well, success is less cars on the road. Success is actually about the council <coughs> selling fewer parking permits, not more. Um, and it's about rebalancing our streets. It's taking back some of our highways um, and, and allowing more cycling and, and pleasant areas for us to go. We acknowledge this is a big and a difficult challenge. We're not saying it's easy. We're not saying it's something that we're going to crack overnight. Um, but as I said earlier, one of the key messages is that we are here to listen and we are here to encourage people to do the right thing and ultimately to adjust those behaviours. So, um, we very helpfully have a slide here that actually tells us what isn't included in the consultation. Um, and at the moment, that's the changes to the 20 minute free parking across the borough. It's about changes in the diesel levy and emissions based charging. Um, if any of you were listening to the, uh, the cabinet meeting this week, you would have heard both about the diesel levy and the emissions based charging. And ultimately, they will come back for council's consideration um, in the autumn. Uh, the diesel levy was introduced in 2017. The council always said that they would give it a two-year start to see quite how that worked. Um, so the results of that we'll start to learn a lot more about, um, and that will come back. And again, tying in with the whole air quality agenda and that public health thread um, is about potentially, not at the moment, um, but if the council does get new systems in and we are in a position, then potentially we could look at emissions-based charging. So, probably what you're far more interested in is exactly what we're going to be consulting on. Um, that consultation starts this Friday. Um, the website is up. Um, it's not quite live in terms of all of the information being on at the moment. We're just finalising that. Um, but that will technically start on uh, this Friday. And the consultation will run uh, right the way through to the 5th of May 2019. Um, this will include changes to the council and car parks. It will talk about the pay and display on street charges. And it will also talk about um, resident and visitor permits. Um, in controlled parking zones. Ultimately, it is true that the vast majority of charges will increase, um, but there are going to be incentives um, for uh, electric vehicles and, and lower charges with regard to that. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to my colleague Ben Stevens, and he's going to talk a little <coughs> bit more about the, uh, the what of the consultation. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ben Stevens. I'm Head of Parking Services, relatively new to uh, Merton. One of the things I have found interesting is how they work in parking. We normally work with traffic, 
We're actually here working with public health. We're working with the air quality team. Uh, and that is a real change. That is different to what I'm used to as well. Um, so it is a, sort of a, a genuine view, a genuine direction of travel that Merton Council taking, and that's new and different to me, so that's certainly been interesting. Okay, I need to step back so you can read that. Um, as mentioned, we believe it's fair and proportionate. Some won't, some will. Okay, That's part of the consultation, that's where we are, we're going to learn. But we believe that is right and proper. The reports have gone through a democratic process, it's gone through a scrutiny meeting, the cabinet meeting. They have all looked at the information and the proposals and they have been passed to come out to consultation. And so we believe they are fair and reasonable. Um, a couple of things. So, probably best if you go to the next slide and it'll explain how this works. This will be on the web page um, so you can have a look at a bit more detail. <coughs> the basis of the charging is a relationship towards where you live and access to public transport. The nearer you live to very good tra public transport, the less of a need to use a car exists. So if you live right in the middle of Wimbledon Town Centre, you have a lot of opportunities to get <coughs> places using public transport. People still need cars, people with blue badges, disability, motability issues, we accept that and we acknowledge that. But equally, if you live not near public transport, it's far more difficult to, to move around without a car. So within that, the tiers and the charges reflect. Okay, so the, the centre around Wimbledon Town Centre is tier one. That is where we're suggesting that it's the highest charge that we will make for controlled parking zone permits. Moving out, <coughs> excuse me, um, to the Rains Park, Malden and Collier's Wood around the station area. Yeah. That will be defined as tier two, which is a step down. So it's the lines of green, that would be the Rains Park, Rains Park, Malden, and around the station, Collieswood. Yeah, that's tier two. Yeah, because yeah. you've got two different greens there. They're all the same charge. Sorry, yeah, the um, Aqua, let's go over that. Um, and the Mitcham um, area and further out, that's going to be defined as tier three because the access to public transport isn't as good. <coughs> Within that, we've got another level. So there are bays that are enforced for one hour a day in some parts of the borough, and bays that are enforced for 15 hours in a day. So, depending on the length of your enforcement time that's required, there will be a charge for that as well. So, if you live <coughs> right in the middle of Wimbledon Town Centre, and your control zone is enforced for 15 hours a day, that will be the highest charge in the bar. If you live out, away from public transport, and you're only enforced for one hour a day, that will be a cheaper permit to buy. So there's a reflection on that. The top charge will be £150, and the lowest charge in the bar will be £70. Currently, across the whole borough they're set at £65 yeah. and they haven't changed for approximately 10 years. We're not in it for 10 years. We haven't, no, we haven't been paying for 10 years. It's not about 6 years, 5 years. It's not 10 years. 10 years maybe in central Wimbledon. It's on the control parking, it's been longer than 10 years. Okay, but certain areas are not been the borough generally, sorry. Within the borough generally, prices have not been up. We haven't got 5 10 years. Okay, so that's controlled parking zones. the next one. Um, so on street charges are going to change as well. Um, currently you could be in one street and you could have three or four different charges. We try to simplify that and take into consideration congestion and hotspots and where cars circle uh, and, and cause you know, more emissions to go out. So in the south of the borough generally, which is the, should we go aqua on that one? <laughs> Um, we are looking at a charge of £1.50 per hour on street. 
Um, at the top here, which includes Wimbledon Park, Wimbledon Common, uh, South Wimbledon area, and Mains Park, will be three pounds per hour for the closing. Wimbledon Town Centre, there's approximately 255 bays that are right in the centre and on street. They're proposed to be £4.50 an hour. End of retail. And on Wimbledon Village, um, there's a, an area off of Wimbledon Village around the common where there isn't just quite a bit of capacity left. That is a cheaper charge because we do not want people circling and being in Wimbledon Village looking for spaces on the high street. Okay. So that is the proposed structure. Again, charges have not been risen for quite a long time, but what we want to make people do is think and nudge them towards, can I walk to those shops? Can I jump on the bus to those shops? Sorry, I've got, do I need to use um, the car? Sorry, I've just got to make a point here. Sorry, this is, sorry no, I've got to I, make this I, point. I, I, no, no, I've I, got I, to I, make I, it. I appreciate that, but if we can just give them the opportunity to first finish the presentation, no, no, but questions on, will come in the end. No. I appreciate everyone's It's about families leaving cars for children. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 I, no, I, 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 all right. I appreciate you may want to ask questions, but I think we should allow him and give him the opportunity okay, to finish right, the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So that's the structure, that's what we believe is, is a fair and reasonable and logical way. Now, you will probably disagree with that, and you'll yeah. probably have strong yeah, yeah. views. As Cass said at the very start, we want to hear about those views. Oh, okay. yeah. We want you to tell us about those, and we will consider them. We will put all those responses together, and that will, as part of the process, go back to Cabinet, back to scrutiny, for them to make the decision. If we just allow him to finish and then questions can be at the end, please, Councillor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> in general, we acknowledge there are significant increases in parking charges. We accept that, we acknowledge that. But they are, we believe, in line, well, they are through benchmarking, similar to other London boroughs, and we remain competitive in that respect with our neighbours as well. So yes, it is a significant increase in some cases, but nevertheless, they are still proportionate to neighbouring boroughs as well. Um, within that, has mentioned electric cars and other incentives for cheaper parking. Um, we're developing the car clubs, as you're aware, so we want to you know, give people access to, to a vehicle, but not necessarily have to own one all the time. So those initiatives we're aware of, of as well, and we're looking to develop. So that's, that's the structure behind it, there's a why, there is an absolute why, and we're talking about public health, we're talking about air quality, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike, who will put the picture and then say the benefits of what we are doing to health and, and to the public. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Mike Robinson. I'm the consultant in public health for London Borough of Merton. So I'm, as, I, as the other speakers have said, we're really interested to know your views through this consultation. This is uh, a change and it's uh, new ground, so it's very important that, that mm. actually the, the, the council has a full understanding of, of, of people's views. So I'm going to just describe very briefly, uh, you've probably heard quite a lot of this before in terms of the, 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 the thinking behind this. Why is it being proposed? And it's a public health argument. Less car use actually means fewer trips by car. And this, these changes in parking, we believe, will be an incentive for people to use their cars less. And I raise this point here that over one third of all the car trips made by London residents could be walked in up to 25 minutes. And walking is probably um, one of the best ways to keep fit, both physically and mentally. And then, if we use our cars less and we have fewer cars on the road, that will mean less vehicle <coughs> emissions and that will mean less air pollution. And uh, Caf's already said something about this. The main source of air pollution in Merton is from vehicles on our roads. So it's not the only source. But it, but it is a major source. Um, there's a certain, you know, we've now got very good science 
which shows that, uh, which has calculated that, that there are a definite number of lives which are shortened due to the poor quality air in Merton. It's actually about 70 lives a year are shortened because of our, uh, our poor air quality. And it's 9,000 deaths in London as a whole, but the, the Merton part of that, taking account the air quality in Merton and Merton's population is about 70. Um, other, other points are there's an increasing list of diseases ranging from heart disease to dementia where research is showing a poor air quality leads to uh, more cases of these disease or more difficulty for people with these diseases such as heart disease to actually um, get better. And a particular thing is asthma and a recent survey shows that over two, I think it's that most people with asthma have noticed that poor air quality, when it's worse, makes their asthma worse. And finally, we've recently done a survey in, um, of children and young people in Merton through schools, and I'll show you the graph in a minute, but over half the children think that poor air quality is a problem, a, a, a serious problem, or a very major problem where they live. I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, the other reason, besides air quality, why less car use is good for health is because it means more physical activity. And why physical activity is so important is because we've got an obesity epidemic. We've got, in Merton alone, 150 primary school classes of children who are either overweight or overbese. And we've also got, we estimate, approximately 60% of adults in Merton are actually above their ideal weight. If we don't do anything about this, we'll have an increasing amount of diabetes and other long-term conditions. Simply changing parking is not going to solve these problems. We wouldn't claim that it would do. But these problems that we have with our unhealthy environment, we need to do things at all different levels. And one, this, is, this is one thing that we can do which is just nudging people in the direction of more physical activity. And I think finally, in my bit, is this, this questionnaire was done of children and young people. 18% said air quality was no problem. 40% said it was a problem. 12% said it was a big problem. And 6.8% said it was a very big problem. And as you know, children and young people are the future and, uh, and this is a serious issue which we need to do all the different things we can if we want um, uh, Merton to be a healthy place. I think that's the end of my slides. There's just a little bit more about... Do you want me to do this bit or...? Uh, I can do it. That's fine. Okay. Which is about um, how we're going to actually proceed from here. Okay, so as we said, we are keen certainly for, to hear your views. Um, on Friday, the web page for the consultation will be switched on. We encourage you to go there to have a look. We have the statutory documents, we have some frequently asked questions, and we have plenty more information and links to the reports that have been referred to on there. So you can learn and understand more why we've come to this decision on that web page. What will also happen is you may have noticed on the streets some yellow signs have gone up, public notices. Approximately 4,000 have gone up across the borough. Uh, they're in our car parks as well, in our control zones, um, and on each pay and display machine. So we're informing the public of, uh, we'll bring it to their attention, so you can certainly uh, get the message out. We want you to go online. There is a questionnaire on there to get the views, whether you know you agree with air quality is a problem or not. But ultimately, it's an open opportunity for you to write in to us and express what you like, what you don't like. Um, but also, we want to hear any ideas and suggestions you can think about how we can tackle air quality and public health as well. But equally, we want to know what you think about our proposals and our charges. So you can do it through the web page uh, where there's some links, or you can uh, write in to us by all means at the Civic Centre, um, or you can email us direct. They will all go into a, a central inbox, and as I said earlier, they will be amalgamated and they will be presented 
through the democratic process back to the councillors and the cabinet to make the decision. But we do welcome your views. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to do so uh, and encourage you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're going to have questions now. Chris, we're yeah, to... I'm aware on the subject of parking, <coughs> particularly this one, we could be here all night, couldn't we? Yeah. And I want to go home at some stage. <laughs> so, look, what I'd like to do is try and give a summary of the sort of opposition, because there's no welcome to your stupid plans from anybody, I would think. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm being so emotive. Um, but, but Basically, you are entirely right. Um, it is fair that you tax me for the privilege of driving a car because it pollutes. I've no problem with that. I've absolutely no problem with you encouraging me to walk, to cycle and use public transport. That's brilliant. But this tax is totally unfair. If I have a drive and a three million pound house yes. on Wimbledon Common, I pay nothing. Yeah. If I'm in an area with no control parking, I pay nothing. Now, Merton Council, when you, in, when you set up the, the zones, you did a wonderful consultation, road by road, and we all voted. And, and there was discussion, argument, etc. We were told at that time that the charge that you were, you were putting to us was to administer yes. the scheme of parking. But now you're telling us you're putting a tax on. Yes. Now, as part of the consultation, you never said to us, have we also your permission to put on a tax? And as far as I'm concerned, you've no right to do that. Yes, yes, yes. And I go back to the fact that you, that the, that the, you know, it is fair for, for you to tax me if it is done across the board. But this is not across the board. Yeah. Um, and the other issue, um, of course, is, is, is parking meters. Rains Park, we've been working as the Rains Park Association to enhance the area, enhance the small businesses. And, you know, for example, Karen at, at Remedy said to me the other day, with these vast charges for parking, where will people go for their sort of odd lampshade or whatever? They'll go to B&Qs, where there's free parking. And we pushed and pushed to lower parking charges in Rains Park. And we've asked for a 20-minute free parking in Rains Park, and we have had that refused. On this side of the railway it's permitted, but on the other side of the railway it is not. Um, so that's the summary of... Not only my views, but lots of people we've spoken to. And I'm sorry, all that you're saying about health is entirely right, but this is a totally unfair way of going about it. And I also represent about 70 independent businesses. I used to have a shop in Lanes Park. My name's Julie. This business, um, I don't know whether you know, councillors down there, but if you have a business here, a business permit is £400. So you'll park your car in the same space, or 600 You'll park in your car in the same space as if you were a resident. That's totally wrong for a start. Businesses here have to have transport. Okay, that's one thing I want to mention. I don't think, as Chris says, we should be um, penalised for, for living where we are. We haven't got big houses. Some of us need cars. And also, why should um, we be uh, disqualified for having a higher, higher amount of, of charges than elsewhere? It should be across the borough, you know, yes. divided equally. Okay, Maybe it should even go on, I don't know, something else. But that's totally wrong to charge us for more when we live in an area. The other thing I want to say is, how, how can you say it's for pollution when all we're doing is actually parking our car, yes, okay? Exactly. And exactly. also, I've just thought of, if we can't find a space to park, we're going to use up more pollution to find a bloody space to park. So what is the point of having all these charges when deep down we just want to park it's our car tax, near our homes? And just one of the things while I may... As far as I know, from inside information, this consultation is a waste of time, yeah. okay? Because 
Merton Council have already budgeted for these charges, and I think somebody else yeah. over there. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Yeah. So therefore, what is the point of having a consultation mm. when Merton Council have already decided they're putting the charges up? And one other thing, if I may as well, <laughs> sorry everyone, yeah. Merton Council should be looking at other places like Bushy Road, if you can try and stop people from speeding, that will help with the pollution in the area and maybe have a miles per hour in the town centre of 20. So that is a way of yeah. helping pollution in the area. We're the two councillors at the back, if, yeah, <laughs> whichever one wants to go first. <laughs> Both bodies. <laughs> um, I'm Anthony Bagger, I'm one of the Dun Donald Ford councillors. I just wanted to ask people here a really quick question. The council's position is based on the idea that there'll be fewer cars if they put these charges up on rest of parking. So my question to you is, if the charges go up, will you get rid of your car? No. Will no. yeah. oh, no. well, any of you no. put your hand up to say no. you'll get rid of your car? No, no not one of us. No. That's my point. That's a false That's premise. Right? The back. I think it's really unfortunate that the, we've got three officers here tonight who are saying what the council line is. It would be much better if some of the cabinet members who made this decision yeah. Yeah. actually yeah. had come yeah. along. Yeah. 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 We, we, we have the cabinet member here tonight, but then I'm hopefully yeah. it's going to speak yeah. and try and explain this. I don't know whether Mark might want to ask at the end. Yes. It's just not. As Anthony said, the whole legal basis for this is that it's going to reduce air pollution. I asked what the evidence was that less people will use their cars if they put this up. And I was referred to two academic papers, neither of which I suspect anybody in the council has ever read, but I had, which were written in 1988 to 1980, neither of which offers any proof whatsoever that they will actually be in effect. The whole thing is nonsense. Yeah. It's said to be brave. It would have been much braver if they'd announced this before the local elections, this time last year, rather than when they're three years to go before the local elections. So do really strongly urge everybody to answer the consultation, yes. to make the point that it will not have any effect on whether they have a car in front of their house or not, um, and, and to go through all the things the council will ask for. It is rather typical that notice has gone up to the phone to the website and you can't actually access it. Yeah. But the yeah, yeah, you can access it, you actually yeah, yeah. access it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have a lady in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. My name is Mrs Partridge, and I live in Southdown Road, and I've lived there for 39 years. On Saturday morning, I noticed on the street lamp across from my living room that these little signs had gone up. And I thought, I've got to go over and have a look at those in case they're doing some suspension on parking, etc. So I even went over without glasses on and read it. And I was absolutely appalled when I could see about the consultation and the increase. We're in zone W7, so we're paying £65 and they're proposing for it to go up to 120 <gasps> This was a really sneaky way yeah. of telling us what was happening. We didn't even get the courtesy of a letter through our door yeah. to inform us of this. So in other, words, in, in other words, there are people in the street that probably haven't yeah. even read that. I told my next door neighbour the next day, he went across and read it. We've told as many people as we yeah. can to yeah. go and read it, to go and do something about it. Now, we have no choice. We have to have our cars outside our houses. Our front gardens are not large enough to, to make yeah. it into yeah. a driveway of any kind, even if we pay for the drop curb. So now we're caught in this situation whereby I agree with the fact that you're saying use public transport, it's healthier, or to walk. Yes, I do that several times a week. I will use buses or trains where I can, but I do need a car several times a week to go and collect grandchildren from school at York, and that is a fact. I will not give up my car. I don't see why I should. It's my liberty to have a car. I pay for it, I tax it, I insure it. It's a disgrace that this money, I, I am 64 years old, I am retired, semi-retired now, I have a part-time job, I work for a bank for over 40 years. I will find this increase quite hard to pay. I do not get my old age pension for another 14 months. So to double that up is absolutely disgraceful. And if it means that we have to go and get signed petitions, yeah. road yeah. by road, yeah. Yeah. that is what we're prepared to do. Gentlemen, yeah. 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 There's two points. I've, I picked this, this, this is going to happen. So I've been writing to the leader's office for, for about two months now. I've been getting um, long emails back. I hope my emails are passed into the consultation. My name is Stephen Waghorn, MBE. Right? So if you want to track them, um, Helena in the leader's office have got my correspondence because I made a lot of points in that and I'm not satisfied with the responses. Um, I've got a few points here. 
I cannot see how you can justify 100%, 100% increase. 100% increase, more or less. You know, just, oh, let's say 90% increase. 65 to 120. Um, you know, you just hit us all with a large... I'm, I'm retired. Retired civil servant. I've given my whole life to my country. And I don't want to be screwed by a local council. Um, I've just, we just hit us with a £100 charge on the council tax. And they're going to hit us with another 60 quid. But more importantly to that is, is the tradesman's tickets. You're putting up to £5 for a day. Say you've got the plumber coming. That's £5. Now, um, my, my mother-in-law lives in Craven Gardens, which is class of central Wimbledon. She's going to be hit. Poor lady. You're trying to encourage people who live on their own in senior age to have relatives come to see them. She's got to buy another load of um, these tickets that propose £5 a day. or you know, that She can't afford that. She's on a state pension. So it's ridiculous. And the other thing is the whole case about air pollution. Yes, of course we're all concerned about air pollution. Most of the cars in my road don't move. They might move at the weekend. And you're saying you're going to cut air pollution. It's absolute nonsense. Go and stand. As if you stood on Walpole Road for any length of time in any weekday, just stand there and see where the main pollutants are. And it's, it's Kempar, it's, it's rest and waste uh, recycling, skips, buses. Go to the station. There's taxis with their diesel engines running all the time. Huge plume of... Huge plume of pollution all around the station area. It chokes me sometimes. And, and on top of that, and then we've got, down the bottom of my garden, we've got the railway line with huge diesel uh, freight trains about five times a day. And then you've got the fast trains, which are diesel electric. Flying by, you get a big dose of diesel in your back garden. So who are the main pollutants? My car not moving, or all this other stuff. So please review your policies. I'm going to put all this, it's in my emails, and I, I've never felt stronger, uh, sh more strongly about an issue than being conned. My last point is, have a look at Kingston upon Thames, because at least they're honest. They they put it on emissions. emissions. Yeah. Go and look at them. You're imposing yeah. something which is unfair. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have Mike at the front. Uh, Mara, I don't want to criticise unjustly, but, but I do think it's quite inappropriate, um, just to reinforce the point made early, uh, earlier, that um, council officers have been sent along to argue for uh, and explain this policy uh, whilst the cabinet members uh, seem in hiding. Um, <laughs> well, 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 yeah, but, but why isn't he the person explaining and arguing for the policy, or do, they, or do Merton Labour cabinet members only come and argue for policies when they're to do with new parks being... Yes. Yeah. 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 Martin is here. Yeah. I actually saw the leader of the council very recently in his car, massive big black, whatever it is, Okay. <laughs> massive amount of fumes coming out. I wish I'd taken a picture because I would have bloody well sent it to him. It's easy to do something about his own particular I would just like to um, draw people's attention to life expectancy. What? Over here in Wimbledon, average life expectancy. Over here in Wimbledon, average life expectancy is 84 years. Over in Mitchum and Morden, in the east of the borough, life expectancy is 75 years on average. There's a nine-year gap between the west and east in life expectancy. It's a complicated differential. There are many reasons for it. But to suggest, really, that where you park your cars and how much <laughs> you pay to park your cars has really got nothing to do with the big issues of life expectancy and the discrepancies in this birth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Just one thing I would say is, I can understand parking, you put the prices up, you, we all understand it's supposedly going to cut down, but if you lower residence parking, lower it, you will then not feel to, oh, I'll park the car out, it's not costing me anything, I've got a plumber coming, it's only cost a bit, I don't use it, but if you raise it, I'll say, well, hold on a minute, I'm paying a hundred pound a year. I'm damn well going to use this car. I'm going to drive through Wimbledon because I've paid so much more money to get for the privilege of it. You're making people are not going to get rid of their car because they need it. The other little problem you have got is Fulham had this, and I watched a guy do it. He t we've just said earlier on 
We need trees in the area and everything. What are people going to do? They're going to take their 4x4s and they're drive over their front drives and park their car. Be they cannot afford to s two or three cars outside anymore. So what they're going to do is they're going to concrete over the front drive. And I've watched it in my road. I've only been here five years. Oh, wow. And I've watched it in my road. People say, hold on a minute, residence parking, pave the, pave the road. That's not what we want to see, is a, a street of concrete. Oh, right. you know, residence parking should come down. Yes, hinder the people. I agree with you. I have stopped using my car. Uh, by a lot, probably by 20%. I walk, I get on a bus, so but I live in Westway. It's not difficult, I've got a choice of five buses. But some people can't walk that far. It's three quarters of a mile to the station. I can't wait for a bus. I can walk it, I'm fit enough. What am I going to do if I'm <coughs> a bit older? I've got to drive. You've got to think about people don't want to move their car, they want to park it, leave it, as you say, Uber taxi it. Why not? I'm only going to Wimbledon. It's only going to cost me a fiver. Yeah. And the other thing you need to stop are these lorries going through. Yeah. I've stood in Wimbledon and the yeah. diesel yeah. has chucked out. Is... Wimbledon High Street is a shortcut for diesel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's got to be stopped. You stand on the bridge. Uh, if I could, final yeah. two questions for Adam Bush and the gentleman at the front. I don't know Thank you, Chair. You made a point about life expectancy in different areas in the borough. With all the stress you're causing tonight, the other thing that I find nonsensical is about the air pollution and we don't want about obesity. Obesity, I'll come on to obesity. The obesity issue, yeah, okay, we can go and walk around in circles to try and find our car or chase after a traffic in the have got him off and he's done this for, for illegal parking or whatever. Yeah. The obesity issue is a national issue. It's about, it's about eating. It's about our children and people eat crap food. We eat healthily, that costs a lot of money. That's the issue about obesity. It's not about walking, walking to a bus stop to get on the bus to say driving, to driving elsewhere. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Adam Bush, final Thank question. Thank you, Chair. Um, basically, I mean, to conclude, what I would urge everyone to do is to make sure you complete that consultation. Because, I mean, everyone's angry about it. We've heard a lot about it. But unless we get the consultation completed and you urge residents and community groups and people to write in, unfortunately, what's going to happen is just going to be rolled over. So you have to express your concerns fully and in detail, and then we can take it from there. Can I just ask you a question? Oh, Are the that, residents going to be leafleted like we were for the, no. park, the parking zone? Because I think that's really unfair. Because there's, you know, the people that may not notice those yellow notices. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've only, yeah. that's only gone up in our street today. Why? It's just meeting tonight. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I know the, 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 the council so officer could. You know, when we were asked about uh, controlled parking zones, we, we were all leafleted about it, yeah. and we had paper, and it's not not people who got access to the internet. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know that we all in West Barnes and Dundee will make sure that we get the information. It should have been done before tonight's move back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know where the council office is. Yeah, if, if I can just clarify that point, um, there is a full article in the My Burton magazine that will go to every single house. Which is not delivered to every single house. Um, yeah. when, when, and, and we're yeah. not, we are genuinely not trying to say piano notices onto that because there are a lot of them to sniff them out clearly without people noticing that. People don't know. We are, yeah. but we have to, we, as, as part of, you know, legally we're obliged to bring people's attention. So we've gone ahead and we have put it in right. my room. It will also go in the newspapers because it does form part of a statutory consultation. Um, but ultimately, because of the fact that we have to have all of the notices out, before we can formally say that the consultation starts on Friday, that has had to happen over a number of days period leading into that. So that's why there's been a, a slight discrepancy where some people have picked it up in my room, and some people have picked it up on the leaflets, but ultimately the full consultation starts on Friday and will go through to the 5th of May. And by that point, um, it will also have gone in the local newspaper, so everybody should be really aware um, you know, to please come forward and give us your views. With respect, Thank that's you. not the same as approaching people individually through their networks. And also, who have already got a CDZ? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. If, if, if we can just have a brief word from Councillor Wilson so we can wrap up this point. I know we still have uh, Councillor Brunt here tonight.
talk to us about other issues as well. <laughs> um, Obviously, I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking you for the feedback here um, tonight. Like anything, Sorry, who are you? charges. Who are you, please? I'm mm -hmm. Councillor Martin Welton, Cabinet Member for uh, Regeneration Housing and transport, um, which includes um, parking charges. I mean, obviously the reason we are here tonight is to hear the views um, of local residents at this forum. Uh, this will be a huge consultation across the borough. I think that debate needs to be had in terms of um, air quality and emissions, but also as well in terms um, of public health um, here um, in Merton. Um, I do obviously take many of the points on board and I would obviously urge everyone here um, to respond um, to um, the consultation. Uh, clearly, um, the mood of the room is that near enough everyone here is against uh, the proposals. Um, so do submit uh, those proposals because no final decisions um, will be taken until after the consultation um, has been completed and a report goes um, to Cabinet. Um, well, that's part of the consultation process that we can actually listen, we can actually engage. That's why, obviously, we are I'm here um, tonight to actually hear what residents um, in this room actually think um, about um, uh, the proposals um, as well because we do need to have lower levels um, of pollution but also as well encourage more people um, to use public transport but also as well uh, to walk and cycle um, in uh, the borough. Uh, there's also other points as well. Uh, the council is rolling out a 20 mile per hour zone um, across uh, the whole of Merton. Uh, we hope that to be completed um, by um, the end um, of this year. What for? Um, the police Merton. will not do anything. And I've got a yeah, son who's still so, 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 uh, Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't yeah. cars in low gear create more pollution? Yeah. We've given everyone the opportunity we'll, uh, we think to 20 mile per hour is a commitment, to... and obviously we want to create more pollution. 20 mile per hour zone um, um, across oh. Merton, and we obviously know that many residents are very supportive. Um, of having 20 mile per hour zones, even if you may um, um, disagree um, with um, yeah, that. talking about air pollution, um, I'm not sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, I understand people are frustrated, but if we just hear... It's obviously in terms of 20 miles, in terms um, of lorries, clearly the Mayor himself is bringing in um, proposals um, in terms of the ultra low emission zone um, in the centre of London, and that's going to be rolled out to uh, the South Circular um, in a few years' time. Yeah, we do need to have more um, electric vehicles on the road. Hopefully that will happen in future years, um, which will see um, a reduction in the use of um, uh, diesel and petrol cars um, in the borough. And we are reducing cars, um, electric permits down to uh, £25 um, a year um, in the borough. So I would urge everyone in this room uh, to please respond uh, to the consultation and do make your views known. And if you want to email me, um, please do so as well. Thank you very much. Can we ask a question? No, I think we should move on as we've all been given the opportunity. Unless yeah, I'll take questions. questions. If you want to question me, I will take questions. If we just take two questions. Yeah. The reaction of this meeting is yes. totally predictable yes. from what you've rolled out and spent money on. Yes. Why the hell don't you get off your butts and do a sample before you start rolling it? Well, obviously, we've it's all here what people, what, people, what people think. Yeah, there's obviously so many. In the the room, but, um, but there's totally other people out there um, as well. And it's important that people do respond to a consultation before Cabinet makes a decision. That's not that. my point. Why don't you find that out before you roll it out and launch a consultation? You could well, have got all this information doing a small sample. If we just take a final question from the lady at the back. Sorry, can just clarify here. So air pollution, yes. low emissions, we yes. understand all of that. Our cars sitting outside our houses, yes. not moving, yes. but paying for the privilege of being there. Yes. How is that going to do anything with air pollution? Where, where is the relativity there? We're not what will the extra less money to have that? Sorry, where, where will the extra money go yes. that we're going to pay? The money in terms of anything that's raised in terms of permits and transport charges has to be used um, for specified um, purposes um, by Such your freedom what? passes. So the freedom pass is more than, at the moment, has to offset highways, maintenance of highways, roads, footways. So it has to be used for specified purposes. If I could just thank the Council of Wells and the officers that come tonight. I understand everyone here is frustrated and not happy about the proposals to go forward. I think what's key is uh, the dates that Councillor Bush has mentioned about consultation to ensure that uh, these views that we're putting across tonight are also put across 
on this uh, proposal uh, that's been spoken about today. Um, we we uh, will we'll circulate the website to everyone tonight, um, so that everyone's aware where the website they can go onto the Merton Council website to put that rejection and, um, uh, and representation in place. Uh, so if I could thank uh, the council officer and the councillor uh, for asking for answering everyone's questions and enlightening us in the process about to take place. Um, moving on, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the next agenda point, we have uh, councillor. We, we have councillor Mike Brunt, who will be talking to us today about uh, rubbish recycling and cleaning. Uh, <laughs> councillor Brunt. Thank you, everyone. It's Councillor Brunt. Okay, I, I'm not sure how many of you here know me. Some of you may do. I, uh, I've lived in the borough all my life, um, and that's and I went to the school in the borough. Apart from six years uh, later in life when I've, I've worked in South Africa on a health project. But otherwise, I am Merton born and bred. And, and I'm actually coming back to my political roots here by being here tonight because I, I, I have the privilege of representing Dundonald Board for 12 years from 1990 to 2002. And my one small political claim to fame, uh, while Theresa May was winning in Dundonald, uh, sorry, in Dernsford Ward on the 3rd of May 1990. Um, I beat Chris Grayling here. <laughs> so I did my bit to save the country. Uh, unfortunately, we won't go swear in the bar. But we beat him, I beat him here. That was the game. You can imagine the notes. So I, yes, I, I was a, 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 um, a member here for 12 years. I lost understand that, the public have the right to do that, uh, and, but I came back again in the by-election in 2016 and I represent Figs Marsh Ward now. But in the 1990s, I was the, cap uh, the equivalent of the cabinet member, I was chair of environment, and I had um, street sweeping, refuse collection, grass verge cutting, I also had parking, which I'm glad I haven't got now, thank goodness. Um, but uh, I had those in my brief and I'm now the cabinet member for refuse, recycling and street sweeping. So that's my, my brief. I come with that with the history of that and I've always been passionate about having a cleaner environment and recycling where we can. We introduced our first borough-wide paper collection back in the 90s uh, and that's grown to what we have now which is much bigger. So I've come to talk really about the, the rollout that we're now six months in virtually on the, the new refuse collection and recycling and street sweeping um, regime that we have in the borough. We've had some successes that time and I don't hold back from the fact that we actually had some pretty difficult times when the first rollout happened in October. Uh, I can go into that a bit more but there's 64,000 households who needed to have bins delivered to them. Uh, we, I was assured they were all going to be out on time I have my doubts, but I was assured they were all going to be out on time, but 10% were not delivered by the 1st of October. So we started the whole new scheme on the back foot, and that was a problem, because what that's meant is that we hadn't got the you know, the, some of the, the fine-tuning that we're now getting to grips with. We weren't able to do that from day one, and that's, that's a shame. So I, uh, I, I apologise for that. I am the one that's responsible, or I have to, to take the can for that, carry the can for that. It was We were let down by our contractors. But, uh, but nevertheless, we have now got, I'm pretty much assured, every household has a bin. So 64,000 households who were affected, and three quarters of those households had a different day of collection now. So it's the biggest change to refuse collection that Merton's seen, which is a, a quite phenomenal, really, that we've got that underway. What have we achieved since then? Well, we've actually achieved a big increase in food recycling, uh, which is good news, 160 tonnes a month, roughly, increase in food recycling. That's 16 refuse trucks full of food recycling per month, the equivalent of. Uh, our garden waste has increased by 25%, uh, sorry, 20%, gone up from 7,500 to 9,000 customers on garden waste, which is a big growth area, uh, and literally growth area, but we get, you know, that stuff is going into making compost, and that's good news because that's not going into general waste, it's not lying around rotting um, in people's gardens if they haven't got compost to eat. 
we've doubled the number of assisted collections in the borough because this whole debate about refuge collection meant that more people were aware of the fact that there could be an assisted collection scheme. Uh, so we've got, there's virtually a thousand people now, households, on assisted collections, which it can vary uh, to the extent of that assisted collection, but nevertheless that's helping people who are frail or vulnerable or not able to, to move their, their refuse to the boundary of the property, and that's a, a, a tailored service they're getting. We've seen a drop of about 330 tonnes a month of, of waste, general waste, going what was to landfill and is now going to energy exchange, as it's called. That energy exchange facility over at Benjamin Lane is creating steam when it's um, incinerating the waste, which is then creating electricity, which is going into the national grid. So that's actually going back into the national grid as electricity. And, and, and also it's created the, the um, runoff of that, the steam, is then heating water for a housing estate that's been um, built over that side. So every month we have in excess of half a million containers emptied uh, across the borough. So that's over six million emptied containers a year, which is a colossal amount. And we, part of that success is what we, we did have, you know, there were issues changing the way people work. And some of our refuse um, collectors, waste operatives, um, whatever the, the current title should be uh, for, for those um, stalwarts that are out there, have been doing the job for 15, 20, 25 years. So getting people to change the way they do something is a challenge in some ways. And we, I know I get reports, and, I'm, and I, I've been monitoring it myself, that some people are saying, well, what's the point of having a, a wheelie bin if someone's lifting the bag out and putting it on the back of the truck? Yeah. Well, we're working on that, and we're, because a, a lifted bag means a split bag. And I've been leaving... Uh, uh, things in the bottom of my wheelie bin loose to see when it was emptied. And, it, and, and until Christmas it had not been emptied properly, it only had the bags lifted out. But now I'm pleased to say that the, the test things I put in there is happening and I'm getting other people to do that as well, encourage them just to monitor that. So I'm confident that we're going to hit our 45% target for waste recycling, uh, for recycling this year. I'm confident of that. We're certainly running ahead of that since the 1st of October. We were behind it before the 1st of October. Sutton reached 50% in the first year. So I want us to get further and further on. Once with our neighbours across the way have a target of 22.3% for recycling. Uh, and and we, we, know, we need to... I, and I'm pleased that we're doing that. So how can we work on that? Well, I, I've started having some workshops with councillors. I meet with... Uh, tomorrow night I've got the... Um, Tuesday collection, which is affects a number of the areas here. We're having a, 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 a workshop of councillors together with Veolia and officers to just talk about, okay, let's put behind us any decision about the, the, the style of collection. Let's make sure that it's working for our residents and making it better. So that's the fifth one. I've, I've did the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, and now Tuesday. And that's going to carry on every year. That every, every couple of months, we'll meet with one group of councillors. Because what I want to do is is just get councillors working together and collaborating and actually making sure that for residents, because residents actually, at the end of the day, uh, they, they need to be served. We're here to serve, and we can't do that if we're fighting about it. So we need to work together on that, because refuse collection is something that we can unify around. Um, so we, when we start, and back in, I've got the figure here for the week being the 19th of November, we had 717 missed bins across the borough. Not good enough at all, but when you compare that with over half a million, that was 717 for the week, so four times that. Why is that so old? Uh, questions. No, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm giving yeah. the contrast yeah. a moment. Sorry. No. The seven, 717 for one week, four times that, you know, we're talking to just under 3,000 out of over half a million. It's now, the week in the 11th of March, which is the latest figure I've got, 360 missed bins. Uh, so actually that's halved it virtually, and that's still too high, I want that right. But there will be the occasional ones where people have, uh, you know, I've said they put it out, but perhaps rushed it out too late and the bins, the, the, the collectors have gone, or, or something has happened that meant that uh, it wasn't collected. Could have been an uh, agency staff who didn't see it, or, but, but there's all sorts of reasons for that. So that's moving in the right direction, and I'm pleased about that. What I would also like to, to commend our staff, and we do have a small band of staff. Uh, we're just about to take on three extra uh, street inspectors to, to try and work on improving the quality of our street uh, cleansing. 
and that has been improving as well. I'm getting feedback that's saying from a number of roads, we think it's better. Uh, now, one of the reasons for that is that actually, um, when we had uh, Tidy Britain looked at Merton Borough, uh, before my time back on the council now, they said that 50% of your street litter is down to split bags uh, and your, the, your style of collection. So therefore, what we've moved now towards is a, what's called an output-based contract where we're saying we want the streets to be at this standard and those standards are specified with A, B or C grades and they're, they're national standards. So we're actually seeing less coming out of people's um, uh, split bags uh, and, and therefore that's led to less litter and less debris on the streets. We're still a challenge, I think, with um, plastic bottles and lightweight plastic things that fly out of the, the, the boxes. But believe me, if I'd been in the, the seat when the decision was made, if I'd been suggesting three wheelie bins, from the beginning, I think that would have been almost a lynching publicly. But, but <laughs> nevertheless, I am getting people who are coming back saying, why can't we have another bin for the plastic glass? Yeah. 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 I'm not saying that we're going to, but I'm getting people that coming back. So what we need to do, I believe, is we need to work together to tackle the source of plastic and glass and cans. Yeah. And, and that's why I never thought I would do it, but I wrote, wrote to Michael Gove, and said I applauded his, his move towards bringing in deposit schemes, or consulting on deposit schemes for plastic um, bottles in particular. Small or large, it doesn't matter for me, I think there should be a deposit scheme. And people should be able to take it back to the source, which is the supermarkets uh, and, uh, and the big stores. Uh, and, or not use them, or encourage people not to use them. Not allow them first. Can we have questions at the end, please? Can we have questions at the end, please? But, but, but I'm saying the local sources, but I think the government needs to be pushing more and more to actually drive people away from that. It still surprises me that I see people carrying loads and loads of bottled water from supermarkets home when I mean, I've grown up to over 60 drinking bottled uh, tap water, um, and I'm quite happy with that. If it tastes a bit off, then put a bit of juice, uh, squash in it. But I, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with the quality of our water now. We need to be trying to back away from people using single-use plastic. 70% of the world's plastic that's ever been produced still exists. It has not been destroyed, has not broken down, it still exists. It's either floating in oceans, buried in the ground somewhere, or flying around our streets. Okay, in different parts of the world. So what we need to do is tackle that source, and we can play our small part in that, and I'd be keen for anything that, any initiative that's going around, that Merton signs up to that, to try to be involved in that. Uh, fly tipping, I'll just conclude on that, because that's a hot topic for, uh, uh, in the borough. Um, I'm pleased to report, if it's a thing you'd be pleased about, that we've recently crushed three vehicles that have been used for fly tipping. We've impounded them, take them away, the owners haven't come in, and we have uh, crushed them. One of them was actually unroadworthy, even though it had a, a valid MOT. So that MOT testing station is now under investigation as well. So you know, we're, we're trying, with a limited number of staff, we're doing what we can to push on that. We're also going to, through, through one of these council workshops, uh, it was suggested that we have a hotline for fly tipping. Well, we're thinking of that like a Crime Stoppers hotline, but you know, we, we need to actually gather the evidence properly. I go around and I break bags open, which I know I shouldn't do. I take pictures of, of addresses that I find in bags and I do a witness statement and I, you know, I put that in or I report it to the officers. But what we're going to start doing now is where we see abandoned waste. Some people think they're doing the right thing by leaving their waste by, by um, litter bins or on street corners around trees. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to tag those, the owner are going to tag them, label them, take pictures, take them off to the, to the depot at Garth Road, and then our, one of our officers is going to go through them. And then we're going to seek prosecutions for those people. Because they, it's antisocial behaviour, we need to tackle that, we need to name and shame. You're going to see my picture, unfortunately, in, in the press coming up shortly because we're going, we've sort of got a We're Watching You campaign going on and I'm going to uh, be part of that, pushing that. So I hope you, you know, I, I'm, I am passionate about clean streets, I am passionate about recycling, and I'm passionate about living in Merton. So I hope that's come across to you because that's the way I am. But I'm happy to take questions. I know that what we've done is not universally um, been popular, but I think that we're moving in the right direction.
gentleman from. Yeah, um, I've been interested in, in the environment and recycling for ages. Mm -hmm. The thing that worries me is the mixed waste. Mm -hmm. right. <coughs> how much of that is actually recycled? Not how much goes in the bin, right. but you see things on television about whole chunks of it because it's polluted in some way. Well, the, 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 the mixed dry waste, as it's called, which is basically your, your juice cartons, your plastic um, containers, cans and glass, is uh, we don't get money for that particularly, but we, it, by recycling it and separating it out into different waste streams, it costs us less to get rid of than burning it or burying it in the ground. So it is a saving to the borough. It's better for the environment because it doesn't end up creating toxins. But, but some plastic is at the end of its recycled life. So in a, particularly um, meat trays, that, that's the classic one. If it's, a, if it's a black plastic, then there's a good chance that that has been recycled to death almost, uh, and it can't be recycled anymore. I'd still put it in there because let it be sorted out and go to the right place later on. But some of that cannot be recycled. But it gets pollute, you, you pollute the air in taking it, paying people to come into an expensive facility to sort it out. It's counterproductive to the environment. But might help the budget, but it's not good for the environment. Well, but, it, but I think, okay, we, we can agree to differ on that. <coughs> Certainly the new, the, the facility that's um, uh, over on Bennington Lane is going to have a visitor centre. I'd encourage people, when that's open, to go and visit and have a look and see what happens to our waste there. Uh, but, but the more we can take out of that whole burying the ground or incinerating, the better. The gentleman in the middle. Yeah. Yes. Uh, have you got any plans to change the collections for um, the flats above shops, for example? <laughs> Flat, flats, the, the, the only people whose collection regime was changed was the, uh, the household. But what's come at the surface from that is that, yes, clearly there's a there's an issue with many flats above shops, some of which are houses of multiple occupancy as well. So, so there are more people living there. They currently have um, bagged collections, blue and purple bags, and it's twice a week, uh, sort of timed collection. That's, that service, I think we need to review, because it's becoming clear in certain areas that's not for, for, fit for purpose. Um, what has also happened is that flats that are under 10 in a block seems that just through custom and practice, they were having a mixed sort of collection. Some of it was a, a, a weekly a sort of um, commercial, almost commercial waste, but a communal waste collection, but their recycled was done with the domestic recycling for the streets. And now, all of a sudden, that's, that's out of kilter, because that's happening, um, it's not paper and card mixed with everything else. So we are working through those blocks and trying to get the right mix for those people as well. Um, as I said right at the beginning, I'm frustrated, annoyed, whatever term you want to use, that we were, were behind the, the game at the beginning because the bins were not out there. We should have been picking that up in the first few weeks. It took us longer to get to that point, but we're getting there. Yeah, there's also, there's, sorry, one, you, you tend to get a house by an alleyway to the back of the shops, mm. and there's just rubbish yeah. stacked up. You can't even get trams yeah. past the pavement. Yeah, I know. And that seems to be sitting there, and just building up and building up. Well, we are... We're trying to do what we can. I, I was outside a, a shop where I, I, I knew that this stuff had come from the shop. It was all around the litter bin, so I started taking pictures of it. Uh, I walked further down the road. When I came back, it had all gone back inside the shop. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting we all go out and take pictures. I wouldn't, I, I'm up for it because that's what my role is. Uh, but I wouldn't expect residents to do that, but certainly report it. Take well, these picture. are the blue and the, the pink sacks, but they're obviously just where they're stacked. Well, the okay, so it's... It, it's, it's Maybe it's being missed when it's picked up, but certainly if you give me the address of where that is, and I know that Councillor Fairclough has already been talking, and, uh, and uh, Chris Lartman here was, uh, came to the uh, scrutiny panel to talk about where it's working, where are the Apostles, but the end of the Apostles on the Kingston Road, and you've got flats above shops, or multiple, you know, certainly properties, it's an issue, and we need to get that right. Yeah. Councillor. Uh, so I'm Councillor Picard from West Barnes. There's three issues in West Barnes. The recycling is the issue when it comes to litter on our streets. Mm -hmm. The boxes are not... I mean, yes, you can say maybe we need another wee bin. Maybe not. <laughs> but they definitely need a lid. Yes. Okay, so there's a lot of residents who are saying the bins are not big enough and the lid then the, the, the needs to be lid. Street cleaning should be after the bins have been collected, not before. We've seen
seen street cleaners coming and then the bin collection coming after that. So what's the point of that? And thirdly, we've got a massive issue with fly tipping in West Barnes. And what seems to be happening is that the fly tipping is happening in private sections of West Barnes. So fly tippers know that the council will not tackle the fly tipping if it's on a private land. And it's piling up. There's one area in Rookwood Lane uh, Avenue absolutely awful. There's been a fire at this this uh, property twice now because of the litter and nothing has happened. Residents are crying out for help and very, very fearful for their lives because nothing is happening because it's on private land. Well, well yeah. um, let me try and go through this one at a time. The, the, uh, the plastic or the, the litter on the streets because of it coming out of the boxes we can request more boxes. I'm frustrated. I requested two extra boxes, to or an extra box to test the system because it's supposed to come with a lid. It didn't come with a lid. So I went back to the owner and said, what's going on? They said, don't worry, they should, they're all going out with lids now. I requested another one and I got other, two other friends to do the same. Didn't come with a lid. So I'm on the case with them and saying, what's going on? In the end, I think maybe we need to just go out and say, whatever you've delivered, you must take the lid out now. Because at least if you've got a lid, you can stack another box on top yeah. and that will stop it. That, that will address it. So there are lids available, and they, they're in the budget, they've got them, so there's no reason for people not having lids. So I would say, if you've got residents, do it as a coordinated list. And send it to me, and send it to the officers, and we'll take it up with the owner for that. The, the street sweeping is, as I mentioned, it's an output-based contract. So it's not necessarily saying every street has to be swept all the time. That it's looked at to say, okay, is this street of the grade that it should be, which is you know, below, you know, above a certain standard. Uh, I've, I've been, just as an experiment with mine, I've been, I've been videoing my street for one second every day. There's an app on my phone, I'm doing one second a day. And I've done that for um, six weeks now. And I don't think the road's been swept in that six weeks, but there's nothing there. Because actually they're now starting to lift, not lift the bags out, they're tipping the stuff um, where, where there's bags that are split or you know, debris blown out of people's boxes, they're clearing it up on the day. Maybe I'm just fortunate, I don't know. But yeah, I, 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 I don't know I live there. I don't know if I live there. But, um, Not with the doors of West but, Barnes, but, but I do, different There's street. other roads I do the same. But, but it's, you know, we, are, we need to make sure, with three extra street inspectors, I believe that will improve as well. That's why we're bringing them in, to make sure they're going out and inspecting the streets. When it comes to fly tipping, fly tipping on private land is a difficult one because that's not something the council can do on, and go onto property. But what we have done in the past and what we can still do is look at uh, alley gates for, for properties, you know, and pathways, and it can even be driveways. Alley gates can be wide enough for cars. So, and the council will work with the residents. A certain number have to sign up and say they're going to pay their part and the borough will pay the rest. But then you get alley gates which stops the, the, the dumping down alleyways and, yeah, and backways. Yeah, that's the problem that we have. Right, well, then maybe uh, let, let me come and have a look at what you're talking about. Please, yeah. please do. Yeah. The lady at the back. Um, two things. You are saying about cleaning up um, the streets and then mm. the dust collection, etc. Now, in South Down Road, it used to be religiously. Mm. Our bins were emptied early Monday morning. Mm. The men would go, and within the hour, the street cleaners were there, week in, week out, religiously mm. cleaning them. Now, the streets are not too bad at the moment. Um, it wasn't so good around November time when the leaves came down. Mm -hmm. We waited a long time to get all those mm -hmm. leaves taken away, and they became very wet and dangerous. So we try and sweep them into piles, then the wind would disturb them all again. So mm -hmm. it wasn't so good around about that time. But one thing I wanted to raise with you is, um, up at the co-op at the Wimbledon Chase, mm -hmm. they had bins in their car park for uh, recycling, paper, bottles, etc. It's usually a disgrace up there. It's strewn all over the car park, there's broken glass, there are black sacks everywhere, um, dirty clothes, because they had, a, they had um, a container where you'd put shoes and clothes in, but it, it's, it's usually a terrible mess up there, so whether the co-op are not chasing it to be done, because it's in their car park, but places like that do need to, it needs to be kept on top with, of it. With, with I think you've, you've hit on a, a, a challenge we've got with the community recycling sites, because that's a Merton site there, yeah. and I go to it quite often, uh, that one, because it's near the doctor's surgery I go to, so I walk down there and I just go and have a look. I, on one occasion, I took four addresses 
One was a library ticket, you know, an excess fine that someone paid on the library, in a bag, a rough, rubbish bag there. Others were Amazon packages with their addresses on them. <laughs> I mean, the, how daft is that? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, and then there were, there were bank statements in another part, you know, bags that I opened up and found bank statements in there. So I took the pictures, reported all that. I don't expect people to do that, but we need to be tackling that. And you've seen more signs up saying we're watching you. And watching doesn't mean video cameras, it means following through. That we've just prosecuted, taken eight people through court, £1,300 each they've been fined for fly tipping. Uh, and, and we need to be pushing that more. I, I was never used to be a name and shamer, but I'm becoming that way now. And I want us to start putting names in my Merton uh, and, and putting it out there in the public. Not addresses, we don't want people to be vilified and you know, housed at their homes, but actually to know there's a consequence to being antisocial. And that is that people will know who you are. I'll ask you questions from your friends. Uh, yeah, just, it's, it's not a question, but it's a follow up. We, you remember we used to have bins on the south of the skew arch there, and we campaigned to get rid of them. Mm. Because what we found was that it was people driving through, mm. probably not even Merton residents mm. that were using it. Mm. Um, and that's made a huge difference there, hasn't it? That mm. area where there's the Astro mm. yeah. turf we yeah. put down. We've also asked for them to be removed on the north side, and we're meeting with um, Council Officer Charlie Baker and with Councillor Stephen Crow in a couple of weeks' time on site um, to say, look, come on, get rid of them, because they are not a, an assistance to the community. Uh, and we've had this discussion about five years ago, mm. and I think it was an 80% vote in favour of removing them, mm. and they're not helpful. Mm. Sure. I mean, there, there were, on my ward, there's on the edge of Fix Marsh, we had, uh, we'd taken it away there, there was a community recycling site, but we had 19 prosecutions in the last couple of months it was there, mm. by putting a video camera up and watching, and it's... It's, I, I don't know how to crack that, yeah. mm. uh, other than keep on... <laughs> but, it, but it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Kingston is it's going to start experimenting with more bring sites, which is what they are basically. When people walk on their way to the station or whatever, they drop off things, they're recycling. So it, I don't know what the balance is. All we can do is just try to be responsive and make sure we monitor it and we move and we change things to try and get it right. Is but it not end, related to the service that you get from home? Because I don't think people want to take the rubbish from home somewhere else. If the service works at home, then people wouldn't have to go and dump it somewhere. I'm, okay, okay, I, I take your point, but I'm not, I'm not talking about general waste dumping. Uh, I'm talking about maybe if someone's got a couple of bottles, empty bottles of wine, you could leave, keep it at home and put it in your, your box that goes outside, or take it to the site you go past the, the, on the way to the station. But you don't want to get there and find it's full and overflowing and not. And if you go to the Sainsbury's one in, in uh, uh, Collier's Wood, very often they don't empty it for weeks. Uh, and it's just it's not a Merton site, fortunately, but it's just piled up with stuff and debris on top. So that's the problem, it's emptying it. Yeah, it's, it's the, it is the emptying, but it's also the inappropriate. So I, I've seen furniture ironing board, there was even someone at the, the Wilton Chase, they put a, a mattress that said four Merton Counts on it. Well, thanks very much. We don't want a mattress just put near a road that like says four Merton Counts on That was probably the bulky waste collection, which wasn't collected, as we, we all know, doesn't happen. Well, okay. So then you have... Yeah. What can you do? Yeah. 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 You've bought your bed. If we can just take a final question, please. Um, I agree that you should get some more street inspectors, but I still think we should get more road speakers. As far as I know, in the area here, there's only two. One does the town centre, me, and I don't think in the apostles the street get nearly as swept, or the gutters, the leaves. You need to make sure that obviously when these fall, which you know what they are, they are done on a regular basis because it's just a lot of the trees are actually owned by the council, which is very frustrating. So if you get the all cleared, I'd, I'd, also yeah. the gutters, because they obviously you know cover the gutters and, and the drainage and everything. And the other thing I wanted to say as well, I've spoken to a couple of the um, the road uh, guys that come and pick up the recycling plate. No, they're not happy because it's more work. So again, I don't know how many people you talk to who are actually doing the new service. Um, I agree the lids on the recycling is a good idea, but again, that could be extra work for them. Um, a lot of the recycling big bins, the lids don't go down because obviously they're not going to. I've got them in the talk because I think they do a good job, but I'm essentially know whether you do actually speak to the workers who do. actually do the work. We do. Um, yeah. and I, I was, in the early days, I was out following um, dust carts just to see what was going on. If the lids are left open, it's because they've lifted the bags out. 
because actually if they take it up to the vehicle and offer it up in the right way, the lid's down, it tips it up, it comes back down, the lid shuts. But, if the lid, no, the, but the lid shuts automatically as it comes down. If the lid is open, well that means they're lifting the bag out, that, which they shouldn't be doing. And if they're lifting the bag out, then there's a risk of litter on the street. If, the, if everything is containerized, particularly on the week where it's the, your um, uh, paper and card and general waste, it contains, there shouldn't be any litter, any debris falling out. So therefore, that is part of the reason this contract has contributed to the, the council coffers in a climate where we've been cut so much from central government, is that we don't need as many street sweepers because there's less falling out of people's waste. But we but still I need to give one to... Now, that, you said that, I was going to pick up, because just when the street trees were mentioned earlier, uh, about trees, and I used to be responsible for this before, that it's a dilemma with trees. And I will, I've seen you, yes, sorry. Well, I'm not seeing you, I'm sure. Yes. Um, that what, that what comes with street trees? It can't, obviously comes with leaves every year that are going to fall and need to be, be swept and, and cleared up. We have a 10-week window where we collect leaves. So we defer the start of that for as much as possible because we actually want to get the leaves in that 10-week time. If we start too early, at the end of the 10 weeks, we're not do, you know, we haven't got a service. That's part of it. But the more street trees we have, the more leaves there'll be. And also, the other side of street trees is the safety issue. Because I, my parents live in the middle of Merton Park. I walk there regularly. I don't have a car. And walking down some of those side roads at night, with all the trees there and the number of street lights there are, you're going through pockets, large pockets of darkness and, and shadow. So I think there's a, there's a balanced argument that needs to be had about street trees. I would always encourage residents to put trees in their front garden, which are near the streets, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful by the street in the, in the right way, but there's less, every tree, everything that sticks out of the pavement is somewhere where someone might fly to. Thank Whether you. it's a tree, I'm aware that we're running out of time the, and uh, we've got a couple of you will point. If we just keep a question very brief and yeah. the response as well. Can you not budget for some of these leaf blowers, sacklers, whatever? Mm -hmm. Six, go and get them trained. Go round Grand Drive. I've got a tree at the end of my path and I'm forever cutting the bloody tree yeah. because it grows up. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes from the council. I write a letter, nobody comes. I'm sweeping the leaves up because I've got an old mum with macular degeneration. They're ankle deep round my path, front of my house. If she falls over, you're going to get a compensation claim. Why can't you just have somebody going around with one of those suckers? They could do it in no time. Walking up to the ground, I've served you. Councillor Brown, well, you just keep the response brief. <laughs> I will try to be brief. I mean, in the past, they've, they've used, in the old contract, they used to use blowers that just blew it away somewhere. Uh, and that seems to be crazy to me. But they have actually got suckers this year. And they have been using those. Whether it's been across every street, I don't know yet. Because I'm on Grand Drive. Nobody right. does a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Brunt, for coming along with us tonight. Uh, I, I believe the last yeah. Yeah. Um, points I'm the just going to spend a couple of moments going through these last matters. Usually we spend more time, but it's past all of our bedtime for most of us. Excuse me, sorry, can we just, wait, sorry, if we just keep conversations off the meeting finish. Okay, the railway. Did you see today that they've been on the embankment on the north side clearing the litter and clearing the shrubs? That is great news. Um, and they're going to continue doing some work there because we've been campaigning for years to get them to do it. And what we've got to make sure we get right is actually the aftercare. Last time they did this uh, five years ago, uh, the aftercare didn't happen. So we've got to get that right. Um, and with a bit of luck, the bit of land on the south of the railway um, may be sorted so that the exit from the railway will be much easier for pedestrians. Watch this space. And we're hoping also the station entrance might get a bit of beautifying. The cycle route from New Malden to Wimbledon is going to come online or whatever it does sometime in the coming months presumably and there will be implications through Rains Park and we're watching that closely. Um, pa uh, planning matters, are there any key ones? There was a consultation uh, at the Manning 
plastic site that David Dean chaired, um, and um, they have tweaked those plans, and they're looking to put in, as always, um, more units, and that is being questioned. But the fundamentals of that site are that it's residential and some office space for rent. Um, Bushy Road, that plan is going ahead, if you remember, down the end of Edna Road. Again, there are some tweaks happening to that site, but it's going on basically as was agreed. And the Tesco site, um, in the road there, there's a big development on the back of Tesco car park, taking some of that land, um, which is quite extensive. Um, Anthony, have you got any comments on uh, any of those or any planning matters? Um, I was going to add on the planning plastics. The developers there told me that they will start building next year, probably early next year, is their intention, um, regardless of whether the changes are approved or not. So basically they want to stick another 24 flats into the site. They currently have a planning commission for 99. Uh, they want to make it up to 124. Um, my maths might be out. Um, they said whether that goes through or not, they plan to start building. And they will be for rent, not for sale. Uh, and that is how they will maintain some affordable flats on there. Because they say it's not viable, as they're telling it. Um, there is some parking on the site, which is unusual. There are lots of uh, planning applications in the area, although 33 uh, sites, which will separately will be able to rent them separately from the, the flats themselves. <laughs> So that's on many plastics. Um, I didn't know if you also wanted to mention the Sodi Bowling Club, the license. Um, so it's not planning as such, but there is a uh, premises license application for Sodi Bowling Club, which you, you might know is uh, between Kingston Road, Low Downs Road, and Abbott Avenue. Um, you've got until the second to get your <coughs> comments in on that. They want to uh, basically the upshot is to continue to sell alcohol up until half twelve, I think, it is on Fridays, and one on uh, Saturdays. Um, which seems to be part of the plan to turn it into a sort of uh, a venue rather than a bowling club. Um, lots of residents concerned about that, and maybe some people here tonight. Um, so please do have your say. Um, I also wanted to mention that there'll be a post office coming into uh, Nelson News down in Merton, Merton Park, a little bit out, out of here, but that seemed quite good news, I thought. Um, and lastly, um, uh, mine's gone blank. Uh, the name of the road that. Uh, Martin Way, that's it, Martin Way. There's a pedestrian crossing coming in Martin Way, which we first pushed for in February 2017. My, it was my birthday present in February 2017. But they said they'd go ahead with it, TFL and, um, and the council. And you may have seen that the pedestrian refuge increased in size earlier this year. They promised me again on my birthday this year um, that the actual uh, work would go ahead in April. I should add, um, it was actually built on February the 29th, so that hasn't existed in either of which years, which is possibly why we don't care how the But it is coming. Uh, and that was it. Thank you. Did I find anything else? No, it's fine. Um, yeah, go ahead. I brought this up for the last 12 years. The appearance of Rings Park Station itself far outweighs the litter problem on the embankment. The Hans, Hans Sarbert, at root level, has been rotting for the last 12 years. We've asked them to worse. get rid of it, and we're continuing to do that. This has been going on for 12 I years. I know it has. Stephen Hammond has been involved, etc., etc. I know. Why don't we rail. get an access <coughs> network rail? Are they going to do something or not? If they say they're not, at least we've gone. Exactly. Good right. question. And we can going on at that. As a civil engineer, I'd say to them, You've got a program of works. Show me on that program of works when you intend yeah. to do this work. And if it's not on it, they don't intend no. to do it. Question from the gentleman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in your meetings, Mr. Larkham, uh, with um, Network Rail and South Western Railway, uh, have you uh, pointed out to them uh, that uh, the service um, that is provided from Motspur Park and Rains Park to London is getting worse. We were told in August 2017 that things were going to get better when half the platforms were closed for some weeks. <coughs> we have strikes, um, cancellations, delays, 
<coughs> Monday, February the 11th, uh, my PA uh, had to wait uh, uh, on, a tr uh, on a train for three hours between Vauxhall and De Waterloo. Um, <coughs> we had, uh, at the weekend, uh, four carriage trains when people were going up to London on this, on this march. <coughs> the service uh, is just deplorable. <coughs> and I know that uh, you talk about uh, getting a lift uh, at the station and the appearance of it, but um, most <coughs> of us who live in this area are more concerned about we um, want to have the, trains, the service. Don't we? we do indeed. Yeah. <coughs> and, uh, there used to be uh, a consultative transport committee uh, h held by Merton Council. I'm not sure if it still uh, exists, but I think it's about time that we were putting pressure uh, on the Department yeah. of Transport to improve uh, <coughs> the service uh, in this part of uh, South West yeah. London. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to add anything else? Pretty happy, yeah? Um, so, just as a, as a way of an update, our next meeting is on the 13th of June, which will be chaired by another councillor. Um, I don't think there's anything more ready to add. I'd like to just thank everyone that for coming along tonight and talk to us all. Um, but, yeah, that's the meeting closed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.